demons out. Oh, Satan will do anything to distract you, won't he? That whole intro, that little bump there always makes me think of that movie that you're getting ready to go see and they kind of build up the level of intensity. And that's exactly what I hope that we've been accomplishing in this sermon series entitled The War and how do you prepare and how do you fight the devil and win. Well, there's a lady who died and she, of course, went to the pearly gates and that's where she's meeting Peter. And when she gets there, she asks, you know, what what do I have to do to get in? He said, oh, it's simple. Just got to spell one word. And she said, well, what's the word? And said, well, the word's love. And of course, that's a no-brainer. And she entered into heaven. And however time happens in eternity, a few years have passed. And Peter comes up and says, hey, I need a favor. Can you kind of be at the gate for me today? I can't be there. Would you hang out at the gate? And so she said, of course. And lo and behold, her husband shows up at the gate, and they were surprised to see each other. And she said, well, how have you been doing since I died? And he goes, oh, man, it's been great. You remember that young nurse that was taking care of, me, uh, taking care of you when you died? Well, I married her, and then we hit the lottery. And remember that little old house we had? I sold that. We bought a big old mansion. We've been traveling all over the world together. And in fact, I was in Cancun when uh, this happened. I slipped and hit my head, and here I am. And it's like kind of a bummer, you know? And she said, really? And he said, yeah, so what does it take for me to get into heaven? And she said, oh, it's really simple. You just have to spell one word. And he said, well, what's the word? And she said, Czechoslovakia. <laughs> now, there's a lot of bad theology in that story, as you know. But there is one part that is very true to the Bible. Just because we've become Christians doesn't mean we still don't have battles in the flesh. Amen? She was battling in the flesh, and we have those. And, uh, you know, our battles with the devil are never over. When we become a Christian, I think, in fact, actually, the intensity increases in the battles that we have with Satan. And so that's our conversation if you're a guest of ours, we've been doing this for a few weeks. We actually have a few more weeks still yet to go, and so I hope that you'll join us on the journey. I say try five if you're a guest of ours. Come back a few times and kind of get to know our church family, and we're glad that you're here and with us. But specifically, we've been talking about this war that we live in. And last week, if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, I was in Ephesians chapter 4, and I couldn't get it all done. So today we're going to pick up in Ephesians 4 where I left off. And then let me say, for those of you who've been asking, the next two weeks will be back to Ephesians chapter 6 where we talk about the spiritual armor of God. So we haven't got to the armor. We've been talking about how we should dress, what should we wear to war. So today I'm going to finish Ephesians 4, and then the next two Sundays we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 6 talking about putting on the full armor of God. So, key text for today, you can hold this all morning, we're going to look at it several times, but Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus, and he writes in verse 22, you were taught with the regards to the former way of life, your old self, the former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, to put on a new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So Paul is writing, I won't read the whole chapter, the whole text, but he's writing and he gives us this laundry list of, of bad habits, hurts, habits, hang-ups, sin is what the Bible calls it, the, the things that we hang on to from our old life before we were Christians. And then he gives us some things that we should put on. And so I specifically want to kind of look at this text from the perspective of the things that we hang on to in our former life. Because when we do, the scripture says that's giving a foothold. You're giving access to Satan that he can get into your life and still work if we're giving him access. And so let's begin. If you're a note taker, uh, here's the principle I want to begin with before we look at that laundry list. The enemy assaults are best exercised where the authority of Jesus isn't recognized. Jot that down if you're a note taker. The enemy's assaults, his attacks, are best exercised where the authority of Jesus is not recognized in our lives. You know, when the enemy tries to launch his attacks against us, and it happens daily... He's not going to attack our most guarded defense. He's not going to attack where uh, 
where we're at our best and our strongest. He's actually going to attack where we're at our weakest, where there's a breach in the wall, where we have a chink in our armor. He's going to be looking for areas in our life that we've not fully surrendered over to Jesus, that, that we've not recognized the authority of Jesus in that area of the way we live, of our life. Folks, the devil cannot stand against the authority of Jesus Christ. He tried that once, remember, 40 days in the wilderness and the temptation? He tried that, and he got soundly defeated. It didn't work well for him. But what the devil will do is find areas in our life where we have not recognized the full authority of Jesus, and those are the places specifically that he's going to be looking to attack. Now, let me clear this up, kind of a little side note here. I'm not talking about our salvation when I talk about this. Okay, this is not about salvation. This is more about what the Bible calls sanctification. That's a biblical word. It means to be set apart from. You know, we're called to be in the world, but not of the world. We're called to put off the old and put on the new. We should look, right, church? We should look a little different than the world around us. Last week I said, uh, as Christians, we've never proclaimed that we're sinless, but as we grow in our faith, we should sin less and less. We should certainly sin less and less than others who are not Christian, right? I mean, is anybody with me? We've been sanctified. We've been set apart as followers of Jesus. We should look like who we claim we are. We're talking about the Christians dressing in such a way that we look consistent with our new identity in Christ. The truth is, we have some old clothes in the closet, right? that we used to wear them all the time, and that's B.C., before Christ. But you know how comfy those old clothes are? Anybody got that old sweatshirt, that old T-shirt, and your wife's been telling you to throw it away, but it's like, oh, it's so comfy, and it just fits right, and it's got holes in it, and she's waiting for you to leave the house so she can kind of send it off to Goodwill or to the trash even. It's that old, you know, she just throws it away. And, and we hang on to those things. But the truth is, they're not good for us anymore. They don't, they don't fit us the way they ought to, and it's just not good. We as Christians, folks, we have been remade. We have a new image in Christ Jesus, and the old clothes, they just don't fit, and they don't look right. Let me read this passage of uh, Ephesians chapter 4 again, but I want to read it from the perspective of the message, and that's a paraphrased version, but I really like the way it reads. Since then, we do not have the excuse of ignorance, right? Before Christ, now we've met Jesus, we know Jesus. Since then, we don't have the excuse of ignorance. Everything, and I do mean everything, connected with the old way of life has got to go. It is rotten through and through. Just get rid of it. And then, take on an entirely new way of life, a God-fashioned life, a life that's been renewed from the inside and working itself into your conduct as God accurately reproduces His character in you. We're talking about being Holy Spirit dwell. When we came to Jesus and we put our saving faith in Him, we received salvation. We receive the imputed righteousness of Jesus, meaning that Jesus representing for us as a covering for us of our sins, that we have secured our ultimate victory in Jesus. So I'm not talking about our salvation. Jesus has taken care of that. What I'm talking about is our daily battles. We already know we've won the war. But it's just like guerrilla warfare, right? The the enemy has lost, but they're not giving up. And they're still attacking. And we're still fighting. And if we're going to win those battles, this is what we're after, if we're going to win those battles, we've got to put on daily the righteous living of Jesus. The new self. The new image. The new identity. And so there's some areas in our life we have to be honest with ourselves that we've not fully submitted over to the authority of Jesus. And those are the areas where Satan's going to try to come in and attack us. Those are the areas we keep reaching back to the old comfy self and old clothes. 
problem is when Jesus, or once, uh, once they get a foothold, when Satan gets a foothold in our life, he can attach them stronger, even more stronger. We say if you, if you give him a foothold, it can become a stronghold. And so every day, folks, every one of us wake up and we go to our closet and we say, what shall I wear today? And Paul says, spiritually speaking, in the book of Romans, today, clothe yourself in the Lord. Jesus Christ. Do not think about how to gratify the desires of the old self, the sinful self. No. Clothe yourself in Jesus. This is what the Apostle Paul is talking about. We have got to clean out our closet. We've got to throw away some of those old clothes and never wear them again. So, Here's some old garments that Paul says you need to get rid of to never wear again. It's not an exhaustive list, but it's what he's given us here in today's text. And I want to look at a few of those. So jot this down. The first old garment that we can never wear again is dishonesty. Look back at the text in verse 25. Paul says, Each of you must put off falsehood and put on speaking truthfully to your neighbor. Folks, we live in a culture that glorifies lying. Lying is almost like an artwork in our culture. It's the native language of the world because guess what? The prince of this world has been a liar since the beginning. In fact, we call Satan the father of lies. That we lie in so many ways that there are some industries that couldn't even exist if they had to tell the truth. Some professions would just go out of business if they had to tell the truth all the time. I mean, how per pervasive is lying in our culture today? In our lifetime, we've watched presidents look straight into the camera and willfully and boldly lie to the faces of the American people. And then we're told, well, you know, that's politics, that's spin. No, it's a bold-faced lie. And that's our culture. Lying, folks, biblically, it is a foothold for Satan, and he's going to exploit that to the fullest. And all kinds of vices and addictions will begin to creep into our life if we're guilty of putting on this old garment of lying and dishonesty. And we dig that out. And we put it back on. Have you ever dealt with anyone in your family or maybe yourself with some type of an addictive behavior? People who are addicts have learned to lie. They've learned the art of lying. Addicts are professional liars at their best. And then we think we have to help them if we can clean up the addiction, then they're going to stop lying. But the more and more I think about this, I sometimes think if we could just do it the other way around, if, if we could help them to stop lying, then that would help them to overcome and clean up their addictive whatever, fill in the blank. Because it's such the nature that when we start to lie, these sin habits and addictions can creep back into our life. Constantly uh, making a mess of how we live. And so we've got to stop the lying. Constant dishonesty in our lives gives the devil permission to work. And he works his way right in. I love the story. Go read it this week. But Acts chapter 5, if you remember the story of Ananias and Sapphira. And they had sold some property and they were telling people or the word had gotten out that they had given that to the church, which wasn't true. They actually held some back to themselves. And in Acts chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, this is what it says. Ananias and Sapphira, how is it that Satan has Satan? How is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you've lied to the Holy Spirit and kept for yourself the money that you received from the land? Now, what was their sin in this situation? Was it greed? Because they wanted to hang on to some of the profits of the sale? Well, yeah. Was it hypocrisy? Well, they said one thing but did another? Yeah. But what was at the root of all of the sin was lying. They were guilty of lying. Lying is the vocabulary of hell itself. And we as Christians can't wear that garment. No more. Old self. Gone. We put on the new self in Christ Jesus. 
That's the first garment. The second garment we need to get rid of and wear no more is that of greed. Greed. Look back at the text. It's in verse 28. The scripture says, he who, he who has been stealing must steal no longer. Put off stealing. Put on hard work. He must work doing something useful with his own hands that he may have something to share with those in need. Folks, greed is the, the pa- powers the engine of more people than any of the other fuel that hell has to offer. It's, an, it's amazing how we can be so driven by greed, especially, I'm going to say, here in America. And you think about so many of the sins like stealing or envy or coveting, even dishonesty and lying. So many times those are motivated by greed. We are a country eaten up with greed. There's an old book that's been published long ago, but it was entitled The Day America Told the Truth. And in the book, the authors of the book surveyed 10,000 people. And they said, what would you be willing to do if I gave you $10 million? Here are some of the responses. 25% of our American people, our own countrymen, 25% said for $10 million, I would abandon my family and my church. (laughs) Goodbye. So long. Take the money and run. 23%, so almost 25%, said they'd be willing to be a prostitute for one week. 16% said they would leave their spouse. 10% said they would withhold testimony uh, in court and let a murderer go free. 7% said they would kill a stranger for $10 million. 3% said that they would give up their own kids for adoption for $10 million. (laughs) Actually, I said that, Teresa, in the last hour. The last hour I said, I can understand that one a little bit. There are days and moments. It was like (laughs) blessed subtractions. I don't know what it is. $10 million. See? It's enticing. (laughs) See how Satan works. And the Bible says, beware for what? The love of? Yeah, greed. Beware about being greedy. It's the root of all kinds of evil. And the devil uses it. In fact, remember Jesus, as he was going to the cross, he used it with Judas. If you read this week, chapter 12 and uh, 13 of the Gospel of John, it tells a story about Jesus going to the cross and Judas and his greed. And in chapter 12, it talks about his intent to steal some money because he was greedy. He was a thief. But when you get to John chapter 13, the, the Scripture says the devil gave him a plan to sell Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And while they're in the upper room having communion, that last supper, as Jesus is celebrating the Passover with his apostles, he told Jesus, uh, Jesus told Judas, do what you've come to do, right? And then the Bible says, Satan entered into Judas. See how this works? You see the attacks? Satan entered into Judas. And Jesus has told us, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Let me give you one more garment that you don't need to be digging it out of your closet. In fact, you need to get rid of it. You need to do some purging. Maybe this week everybody needs to go home to your closets and symbolically do some purging, right? Amen? I know my wife is saying amen. And by the way, the garage and by the way, the attic, you know. (laughs) We got some creative ways we can store some old stuff up in here. Maybe this is the week we do some purging. But let me give you one more here. And that's the idea of bitterness, the old garment of bitterness. And I could be mistaken, but it seems to be that of, of all the sins that I've counseled about over the last 30 years of ministry, the sin that Satan Um, that gives Satan a foothold uh, is bitterness tends to be one of the most common themes across the desk. This sin of bitterness is way too common in our Christian faith. It's a sad thing to report that I think Christians can hold grudges just with the best of any of the worst sinners you can think of. We are right there toe to toe. We can hold a grudge just as good as the worst of sinners. And it's not healthy. 
because an unforgiving spirit is an open invitation for satanic harassments. The church in Corinth, when Paul helped plant that church, he left, but he sent a letter back. And in the first letter, they were discussing how to handle. There was a man in the church at Corinth who had a problem with immorality, especially with his father's wife. Paint the picture there. And Paul told the church he should be disciplined and he should be put out of the church for a season with the intent of that isolation to bring him to repentance. That was the first, first part of the Corinthian story as the church was being planted. Well, Paul writes a second letter to that same church in Corinth. And in that, Paul writes back and speaks about the man who had repented of his immorality and who was now filled with godly sorrow. And this is what Paul writes to the church. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. So, if you forgive him, I forgive him. Don't think that I'm carrying around a list of personal grudges. No. The fact is that I'm joining you with your forgiveness as Christ is with us. I'm forgiving him like Christ is with us. Guiding us. After all, we don't want to unwittingly give Satan an opening. That is a foothold. That is access. We don't want to unwittingly give Satan an opening for yet more mischief. We are not oblivious to his ways. Folks, we know how this works. We're not oblivious to the ways that Satan is working. We've heard a whole lot about all his sly, crafty ways. And I think Satan's number one sly way is using unforgiveness to hurt God's people. And he's doing it. And now that you're a Christian, as a new Christian, you're supposed to not be wearing those clothes anymore. Stop wearing those old garments of bitterness. That I don't know that there's any piece of clothing that looks more out of place for a forgiven Christian or more inappropriate for a forgiven Christian than the coat of bitterness. The story's told about two monks, and they were walking down the river, and there was a little lady at the side of the river, and she was crying because she needed to get across the river, but the bridge was out. And so the two monks, the first monk said, hey, that's no problem. Me and my buddy here, we can just kind of lift you up and we'll carry you across the river. And so they did, got her up high and over their heads and they got her across the river and they set her down. And she was so thankful and so appreciative and she went on her way. The two monks crossed back over the river so they could kind of go the direction they needed to as well. And the second monk, about a mile or so down the road, started to complain. He said, man, my clothes are still wet and they're muddy. And you know how that mud from the river, how that just stinks? And he's kind of complaining. He goes, and I think I hurt my back. And they would go on down a little bit further, another mile or two. And that second month still, it's like, man, I can't believe I, I really do think I've hurt my back, lifting her up over my head. I'm not so sure that I'm going to make the trip. Another mile or two down the river, here he comes again. He's like, I'm not kidding you, man. I don't know if I can even stand upright. It's, it's hard to even walk. All because we had to take that lady across the river. Well, the first monk, after he's heard this two or three times, he says, Brother, have you noticed that I haven't complained at all? And do you want to know why? He said, I set that woman down five miles ago, and you're still carrying her. And that is exactly how we do it. Folks, we are still carrying and we are bitter about it. And some of you have been carrying grudges way too long. And to be quite honest, all of us are tired of hearing about it. Right? Set the woman down. Be done with the grudge. You're not hurting anyone but your own self. And you're opening the door for Satan to have access and a foothold. And Satan will hurt you with that. Remember, Jesus has already paid the price for any sin that's been committed against you. If you're here today and you have felt wronged, guess what? Jesus has already paid the price for any sin that's been committed against you. Not only your sins, but the sins that are committed against you. But we have to remember that the choice you have to make is the choice that Jesus had to make for you. Think about this. The choice... Am I willing to forgive somebody who doesn't deserve it? 
Ask yourself that question. If you're, if you're harboring bitterness, hurt feelings, unforgiving spirit, are you willing to forgive somebody who doesn't deserve it? Because that's the very choice that Jesus had to make about you. That's the very choice Jesus had to make about us. And now he's asking, and now he wants us to make the same decision about the person that we're having trouble forgiving. In fact, Paul closes with these words in verse 32 of today's text. He said, be kind, be compassionate, put off, put on, be kind, be compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, highlighted, underlined, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Just as in Christ, God forgave you. Let me say this as I begin to wrap up. Satan is stopping when the name of Jesus is on our lips. He stops dead in his tracks at the authority of the name of Jesus. When his name comes out of our mouth, when his name is in our heart, Satan retreats when we are clothed in the righteous robes of Jesus. You need to know, you need to know this about Satan. Satan knows the difference between the person who just says Jesus with their mouth but doesn't have Jesus in their heart. He knows the difference. And let me say this, Jesus knows the difference between that person and the authentic follower of Christ. And he knows the person who's wearing Jesus and the person who's just pretending, posing, just wearing a mask, playing the game. There's a story in Acts chapter 19. I encourage you to read that this week too. It's about some guys, and I'm under the assumption they've been following the Apostle Paul, and I'm also under the assumption that they had seen Paul cast out demons and do some miracles. And in Acts chapter 19, some of these guys approach a man who has been demon-possessed. And they, probably following the example they saw modeled from Paul, they said, in the name of Jesus, who Paul preaches. That's why I think they're following Paul. In the name of Jesus, who Paul preaches, you come out. And in Acts, in this 19th chapter, the demon says, wait a minute. We know Jesus, and we know Paul, but we do not know you. And do you know how that story ends? The demon-possessed man beat up these two fellows to the point that they ran away naked and bleeding. How bad of a beating do you have to take to leave that fight naked and bleeding? That is a whipping. And why? Well, we know Jesus. And we know Paul, but you're just playing the game, man. You're, you're, you're pretending. You're posing. You're just wearing a mask. Satan knows who has Jesus in their life and those who pretend. And what I'm saying is this. When it comes to your spiritual life, friends, don't just clothe your life with part of Christ. Don't compartmentalize where you're just half-dressed and running around. Clothe your entire self from head to toe. That's why next week we start on the full armor of God. Head to toe, clothe yourself. Because, guys, when you got up this morning, you took a shower, and you got your hair combed, and you're all slick and ready to go, and you put on a nice shirt, and you, set, you headed out the door... And your wife's like, hey, you're not wearing any pants, man. Isn't that one of those nightmares, one of those bad dreams you have when you go off into public and you're just half-dressed, get on the school bus or whatever? Remember those bad dreams? And your wife says, hey, what are you doing, man? You're half-dressed. And you say to her, I know, but doesn't this shirt look really nice? <laughs> no, that's not what you say. You go back to the closet and you get dressed from head to toe. And that is where we are. If you wear the name Christian, you put Jesus on in every area of your life. You recognize the authority of the name of Jesus in every area of your life, and you don't leave the devil any access, not a place, not a foothold, no room to operate, fully clothed in Christ. That's how we win the daily battles. The war is won, amen. But don't you want to win the daily battle as well? As I do. Father in heaven, I just humbly come before you in prayer. 
And if there's an area in our life that is not protected, because we've never given that area to the authority of Jesus. We never surrendered that part of our life to Jesus. We pray, Lord, that we would be able to come this morning and confess that even right now as I pray, Lord. I'm going to pause for a few moments and, and just encourage as a church family, if there's an area of your life that you've not given over to the Lord, Lord, we humbly come before you in prayer right now and do that. Father, this morning in the quiet of this room here, Lord, we've come to you in prayer and we come to you this morning confessing that we want to get rid of some old clothes, some old baggage that we're tired of wearing, dragging around. We want Jesus to give us some new clothes so that the next time Satan attacks that area of our life, the Holy Spirit will meet him and say, not going to happen. Access denied. This one is clothed with Jesus, and he is untouchable. Father, help us with these principles of war to stop our lying, to stop being greedy, to stop holding grudges, or any other area of our life we didn't talk about today, Lord, because we don't want to give the devil a foothold. We want to win the battles. My prayer today, Lord, is that we will have a greater commitment to right living, and making everyday practical choices about holiness. And I pray that Jesus' name, in his name, Lord, that we have the power that saves, that in his name, with only a whisper, the mountains would shake, that in the name of Jesus, we have our hope, we have our strength, that, Lord, even right now, in your presence, strongholds would break. We're going to sing that song in just a moment that we'd be freed by the love that you gave. Father, I just pray that Satan would have absolutely no access to any areas of our life. And we pray this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.